Great Goobly Boo. Inline six. Whoa. Hmm. You don't see a lot of those these days. But then again, this is the new Mazda CX-90. And you know what? It's all about the numbers. The numbers. 123 and 6. Why are these numbers important? I'm going to tell you in just a second. Stay with us. about a 2024 Mazda CX-90 Turbo S Premium Plus. How about that? Well, that's what it's called. And it's not just, uh, you might, I was initially very confused because as you know, Mazda has a CX-9, which is their full size, their biggest, if you will, crossover SUV. But this is the CX-90. And is it different from the CX-9? Oh man, is it ever. The main thing it has, among many, many different things and great attributes, is an all new engine. It's a six cylinder, inline, turbocharged engine. And you don't see a whole lot of those. There's been a lot of fuss made about the new Ram engine and Jeep engine, which is called the Hurricane or the Comanche Cane or, or the, uh, mild rainstorm, whatever it's called, but it, it's also an inline six that's turbocharged. But this is a Mazda, and it's a very, very powerful engine, especially if you uh, can afford to put premium gas in it. And uh, I mentioned this is a, uh, a vehicle of numbers. Well, the other number I listed was one, uh, one, two, three, 123. Well, that's the wheelbase, 123 inch wheelbase. So this is a very sizable vehicle. And that wheelbase helps give you uh, three true rows of seating, meaning that the third row is actually very functional in this car. There's enough room for human beings, as you will see. So we got all this greatness packed into what is, I say it's large, and it is large, but it's not ungainly large. It's still a crossover, meaning it's a uh, unibody car base type chassis. So it has all these wonderful driving attributes that are far more similar to a car than, than a pickup. But it also has just room upon room upon room. And this particular model with the Premium Plus package is really nicely outfitted. Uh, it has a price reflecting that, by the way. <laughs> it's not cheap, but you have really excellent appointments including the very generous use of Napa leather seating. And they also use a lot of that Napa leather in the trim. So it makes for a very, very good looking car inside and out. And it drives like you might think with the whole Mazda's philosophy that they try to put in every one of their vehicles, which, the, which is translated to the English to be horse and rider as one. So does this achieve these goals as well as being so new, especially in the powertrain department? Well, the only way to know is, to, is by the telling, by the driving, and by the looking at. And so therefore, with no further ado, let's look at that beautiful new inline six cylinder engine because it has a lot of very unique properties I think you're going to be very interested in. Inline six. Wow, wow, look at this. Now, one of the first things you notice right off the bat is you can't see an engine in there. <laughs> they have a huge engine cover, but don't worry. They have facilitated your desire to see what the engine actually looks like. And there are some big modifications in comparison with the rest of the uh, CX line of Mazdas. Look at here. 
This lifts up like this. We take this out like this. And we, uh, how, do I, how do I do this? Uh, uh, where is it? Hang on just a minute. Oh, there it is. I'm gonna put you down, hang on. This is what we do when we wanna access the engine, by the way. Oh, hey, oh, oh hey, there, there we go. Now then, there we go. Look at there, there's an engine under there. I mean, who knew? But here's what's really, really interesting about this. Uh, as you know, in typical practice with inline fours, the engine is mounted transversely. But this being an inline six, ooh, we've gone long, longitudinal with this particular plant. And look at all the stuff we have on here. Well, now on the left, anyone want to guess what this is over here? Huh? Huh? Well, naturally, this is your turbocharger array. And you can very clearly see where the exhaust manifold is. Your turbocharger here, or your, the hot side, the real hot side, right in here, which also spins the impeller, whoops, back here. Thank you. And then uh, the air goes all the way around here. And ultimately, the intake side is over here. So it's really different uh, to have it mounted uh, longitudinally instead of transversely for Mazda because they usually do the other way because normally it's all associated with the vehicle being primarily a front drive vehicle and it also has access to operating the rear drivetrain when necessary. But this is more of a, what I would call a traditional type of layout. And it's a more direct layout directly going into the eight speed transmission. Uh, which is which is fascinating because they decided when they built this thing that they were going to change an awful lot in comparison to the CX-9. And so, well, we have our air box. This is our primary air supply that goes, that disappears behind this wall. <laughs> and it goes in, uh, I don't know. Some of it goes into the actual intake system. Some of it goes into the turbocharging system. Uh, so that's, it's, it's, a lot of stuff is going on at the back side of the engine. Uh, the, the cylinders themselves are just one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way back there. So what does this do with your weight distribution? Well, uh, depending on who you talk to about this sort of thing, you got to remember, like, for example, German auto, man auto manufacturers much prefer this kind of layout as opposed to a transverse mounted. There's exceptions, but not many uh, in terms of when it comes to larger vehicles, especially big sedans and SUVs. They tend to like to go with, uh, well, I'm talking primarily Mercedes and uh, uh, BMW like to go with a tr uh, longitudinally mounted engine because the weight distribution, as far as how it's packaged and how it helps balance the weight overall from the car so you get closer to like a 50-50 balance or a 60-40, whatever the engineers are actually shooting for. Uh, that's a real good way of doing it, but there's, are there downsides? Yeah, there are. One of which is, is the fact that I think that should be all too apparent is so much of the rear of the engine is all the way back here. Uh, and sort of difficult to get to, but who knows how difficult. It may not be that bad. And there may not be that much going on back there because at the front of the engine, there's our belt. I see a little tiny belt down there. And uh, oh, there's one other thing. And before I give you all the numbers, I have to tell you one other thing. There is... A, a mild hybrid involved with this vehicle 48 volts it adds about 16 horsepower onto the power plane uh, power plants output which incidentally has the most dramatic difference between r if you use regular gas and premium gas and I've seen in a long long time so hang on one second and let me grab my nose wow something under the engine has awakened and it's making noises, and it sounds like a fan is turning. Uh, is this thing going to just run off without me? I hope not. <clears throat> anyway, our numbers. Uh, this is, of course, 3.3 liters of inline goodness. Uh, the horsepower is 280 horsepower and 332 pounds of feet in the torque department uh, on regular gas. And uh, the 
Horsepower peak is about 5,000 RPM, and the torque peak peak is much lower, about 2,000 RPM, which is what you would expect. <clears throat> Excuse me, with um, any kind of turbocharging and the supplement of a nice hybrid power plant motor that is helping, especially at the lowest. So then we look at uh, what happens if we put, <clears throat> God, I'm losing my voice, so I apologize. <clears throat> we look at uh, what happens if we put premium fuel in this power plant and it jumps from 280 horsepower to 340 horsepower. Oh my God. And torque jumps from, uh, jumps from 332 foot pounds to 361 foot pounds. A huge difference. I mean, that's, that's crazy. And, uh, of course, the only thing that is the same, whether you spend more for the premium or not, is the output of the hybrid system, which is 16 and a half horsepower. And that's part of all that. That's not in addition to. That's, that's part of your total output. So uh, all this is channeled into an eight-speed automatic transmission and then uh, Mazda's all-wheel drive system. And uh, the eight-speed does, of course, have a manual mode, which, we'll, we'll, which we will demonstrate for you when we're riding around. <clears throat> so, how about that? Completely different kind of uh, engine. It has pistons, just like the uh, transverse fours, but it's a much, much different design and layout overall. And I will say one thing, if you did have to tweak, mess with, or service your uh, turbochargers, since the whole thing is right in here, it's probably fairly easy to do. I don't think you'd be out uh, a whole lot of time and labor if you had to replace, even if you had to replace one of the turbochargers. But I could be wrong about that. You never know until it's actually done. And it may last so well that you'll never have to have it done. But uh, that's, a, that's all underneath. Now, why do we have this big plastic cover that sits on top of it and hinges for your convenience? Uh, I guess just to keep it quieter and also to keep the heat down. This is uh, going to be a very, very hot engine, I can already tell. It's been very hot around here. And uh, it's not running hot by any stretch of imagination as far as what the uh, temperature gauge says and everything else. But I imagine it puts out a fair amount of heat. But the good thing about having the uh, turbocharger exposed the way it is over here is a lot of that heat can radiate out. Of course, the cover stopped that. I don't know. See, I, that's why I'm not an engineer. Uh, what's your oil? A zero W20. Very abundant, very common. And so that is a very, very good thing for those of you who do your own maintenance or if you're just on the road and for some reason find yourself down a little bit in the... Uh, oil department you can pick it up anywhere it's not a problem uh, so we also have some more locks back here so a lot of this stuff you can open up and access things like right here we have access to uh, something <laughs> I have no idea what that is looks like it's primarily the brakes uh, the brake reservoirs in there and over here on this side, which so now I want to see something that will be exciting. Let's see here. <gasps> and there's our battery. So we have a little housing for our battery right here to protect it from the elements. So it's real interesting. There, this is this is the vehicle that has all the covers on it, apparently. And so there you are. You can't wait, you know, you look at an engine like this and you read the specs on it and you find out, wow, I can't wait to drive this thing to see what it's like. Well, I'll tell you one thing about it right off the bat that's kind of unusual is when you first start this engine from a cold start, it, it immediately fires up to about 2,000 RPM. It seems like it, it's fast idle is much faster than what uh, most vehicles are. And why that is, probably emissions oriented. Maybe they want to get the turbo spun up as soon as possible. I'm not real sure. But it's, it's a bit uh, unusual at first when you first start the, the car. It's just, Wah! It's not screaming, but it's definitely faster than what you're probably used to. So, okay, let's take a look at more of the ex exterior and have a look at our cargo space, shall we? More wild revelations for you. Look at the size of this wheel. Oh, my gosh. We have mounted on it uh, some uh, rather large tires to go with that rather large <laughs> wheel. Uh, 
as you can see, our tire size is 275-45R21. These are 21-inch wheels. And uh, our ZX CT60A uh, AS, which means uh, auto sport. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. But uh, this is a whole lot of tire right here and a whole lot of vehicle to, for it to ride around on with that 123-inch wheelbase. So uh, I'm, I was quite, uh, quite surprised, actually, that they've gone that big with the, with the wheels on this. But this may be part of the Premium Plus pack, package that they've decided to go so huge. But if you look under there, you can also see we have pretty big discs, pretty huge rotors. Uh, uh, on there and uh, well the disc and the rotor you know that's, that's, that's what I'm talking about but the caliper itself is actually quite large as well um, and there's a lot of aluminum as we'll see later there's a lot of aluminum used in the suspension components and chassis to help reduce your unsprung weight and I think just to kind of reduce weight in general because this is a pretty damn big vehicle and uh, you know, when you can shave off some pounds, and that's part of the whole Sky Active philosophy, which of course is their performance. Look at the size of that. It really does fill up that wheel well, don't it? Whew, and look at the, the vastness of the wheelbase. Incredible. And you got this uh, very squared off rear end. It's one of the reasons why the uh, third row is so commodious for a third row. And as we come around, you'll note something. In addition to the CX-90 all-wheel drive, we have E Skyactive G. Well, Skyactive G is the engine family. E is, of course, the mild hybrid system. And this is called We, which is what you say whenever the electric uh, gates open on cars because it, it's still novel to some of us who are ancient. Okay, um, first of all we have this initial area here with the uh, third row completely deployed is 15.9 cubic feet of space which is pretty good for a three row. Not bad at all. I mean you can still get some luggage back here even if all the seats are occupied. Now then if we do this, I'm going to try this here. Uh, yeah there we go look at there space oh my god and that's just the third row look at all this space so according to the notage 40.1 cubic feet of space now for your cargo and you still have two rows of seating i mean that's vast 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 and if you uh, fold that other, the two captain's chairs there, you get a grand total of 75.2 cubic feet of space. So very, very roomy and very versatile for all your cargo hauling needs. And it's very nicely finished. You only have one of the little cargo lamps here. I wish you had two because I, I, I just love cargo lamps. And this here is a 12 volt source and this here is an AC source, uh, 150 watts, which is pretty low, but you can still use something. You know, there's you can plug in your electric toothbrush if you, if you, if you desire. Lift up this panel, we have all kinds of storage options here and here, and if you go even further down, I don't know where you grab this thing. I did this earlier, there we go. Look at there, can you see down there? There's, a, there's your spare tire, so you do have a, uh, Temporary spare tire to go along with this well done Mazda. So you can keep on going with all your, your six passengers. <laughs> Wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five. Actually, you and you and five others, I think, is the realistic. You could put three kids, I guess, across the back. Uh, but anyway, that's a 50-50 split on the third row, which is pretty much typical. That's what everybody does. So there we go, very generous opening, fairly low lift over. So if you have heavy items, you have zero trouble putting them in. And uh, oh, by the way, 
If you're so inclined, you can tow a 3,500-pound trailer with this uh, inline six. Or so says Mazda. And I trust them when they tell me that. I think as big and heavy as this is, it could easily handle a 3,500-pound trailer without any great difficulty. So there we go. I mean, it, uh, it's got that, that front end is so fascinating with the, uh, especially with the 21 inch wheels because it almost looks like a Bentley or something up front. It has a very, very different look, in my opinion, anyway, to the rest of the CX uh, SUV family from Mazda. And it's, uh, it's a real unique driver too, but it also has, if you're a Mazda fan, it, often, it also maintains all those qualities that you're fond of. It's, it's very user friendly, uh, very easy to get adjusted to quickly. And it rides and handles nicely, sprightly. Horse and rider is one. As long as a horse is like a Clydesdale, because this is a very large vehicle. Wow, will you look at this? We literally have acres and acres of fine Napa leather. Look, even here. Look at that. Well, hell, if you're going to do your CX-90, you, uh, you need to do it right. And this here is, of course, uh, which version of this? We have a CX-90 that is, in fact, the uh, Turbo S, uh, two point, it's called the 3.3 .3 Turbo S Premium Plus Package All-Wheel Drive version in art, artesian red metallic with our 10 Napa leather. And boy, howdy, this is a, what we like to call a finely executed car. Look here, it's got your electric, Electric adjustments. Ooh, ooh, for your steering wheel. And uh, there's one thing that I, I'm probably going to mention in every video on this car. <laughs> every shot, I should say. Uh, one of the things they did just for me, because I've been complaining in excessively about this for five years. Well, actually, I don't think they uh, they even noticed me when I complained about it, but. Uh, what you're looking at right now is no heads-up display. Now, I'll turn it on. I will turn it on. Uh, communication, navigation will go to settings and in-vehicle displays. Active driving display. That's what they like to call their uh, heads-up display. So, we'll activate it. And there it is. Can you see that? Yeah, you can. So, uh, there it is, and it even shows you a little graphic as far as if you have your adaptive cruise control on, uh, the distance you've set for following the vehicle in front of you. But I, uh, I don't like heads-up displays, so there you go. Bye. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is, the reason I mention this now is because for the longest time, you could turn it off just like I did, but every time you restart the vehicle, the default uh, setting for your active driving display was on. So you had to turn off every single time you started the car. And man, that put me hot. I did not like that. Well, they fixed it. Thank you, Mazda. Thank you so ever much because uh, this is such a great vehicle otherwise. Now, our instrument cluster has, is of course a flat screen like you kind of would expect these days. Uh, the, the ones that actually have analog are disappearing with a vengeance. Um, and I'm going to go back down to settings here and in vehicle displays and uh, instrument cluster display. Now uh, we can increase the text size or decrease it. See, look at there. Funk, a little bit bigger so you can see it easier. That's kind of nice actually. I haven't seen much in the uh, very many do it. What we're going to see over time with these uh, flat screen displays for your instrument clusters, more and more and more setting adjustability. So you'll be able to do all kinds of things with it to make it uh, a lot more palatable for you for yourself. Because you may be a person that just does, you, your eyesight may be such that it's just a help. And it never hurts to be able to see what the heck you're trying to look at. So. What, what they've done here is something I th I'm hoping that we'll see on a lot more uh, instrument clusters like this. That way we'll be able to, f it'll be so much easier on you to be able to see what you're looking for. Uh, this particular display 
Now, I could have sworn I had some different ones. Over oh, right, it's our active sense. I have a whole lot of this well, on and off. Wow, you know, I, I think it, it, uh, it, that's really interesting. It's a hemisphere. There are so many safety uh, black box goodies on this car, if you are into that, that one of the things you're going to have to do if you're not into certain things, like, for example, uh, lane departure warnings, uh, running off the road warnings and active uh, lane centering, all kinds of things like that that we may actually take over the steering for you for a second if they feel that you are in fact deviating from the road and going into the bush. Uh, if you'd like to turn those off, you can do that and they will pretty much stay off. As you can say, this is one of them right here that I have deactivated. You will have to live with that yellow light all the time. and. I don't know how you feel about that. You might you might find it to be distressive. <laughs> Is that a word? Distressive? Yeah, I don't know. But anyhow, uh, there's a compass, and there's a, here's our instrument. Wait a minute. Huh. That's off completely, and this is information. It's telling me, now this is amazing. It's saying I'm getting 26 miles per gallon. If that's true, that's excellent. And you have to remember, our particular engine here is this wonderful new uh, inline six turbocharged, but we do have 16 horsepower's worth of uh, electric power in the form of a hybrid engine. It's a very, very light, mild hybrid. It can't propel the vehicle on its own like a true hybrid, but it certainly helps. And more than anything else, it's designed to help with the uh, smoothing out the powertrain, especially when you leave, excuse me, live well, yeah, when you live in the mountains. No, when you leave a dead stop, uh, it will help boost that low-end torque. So if you are towing a trailer or something like that, which how big how, uh, how big a trailer can we tow? Uh, let's see here. We're going to look it up real quick. It's uh, 3,500 pounds. So if you're towing your 3,500-pound trailer, it will help uh, that initial pull, which is also one of the hardest times for the vehicle to have to pull is when you're leaving from a dead stop, uh, that hybrid system can help with that. So uh, it's nice. It's a, it's a very, very, this is such an interesting power plant, not just from the fact that this is a new engine and you don't see a lot of new engines, like in, you see changes in displacement, but you don't often see a complete change in what kind of engine it is as far as the format of the engine. So that's very cool. Now, what else do we have here? Well, Mazda has always been very good with their uh, instrument layout, in my opinion, and they've also been really great at your control at the control layout. There's a lot of logic to it, but there is one thing that I've I've never been thrilled about, and I'll show you that in just a second. But it's called the command controller, which is basically, if you're familiar with the uh, the history of the BMW franchise, they've uh, they've always had what is called iDrive, which is a knob that you use to navigate your center touchscreen, do all kinds of operations. I've never been a big fan of it, but it's not bad either. It's, if it's well executed, it's a very, it's an, it's an okay thing. And it's very well executed on this car. And once you sort of get your way around, uh, it actually, there's a lot of logic to it. So, well, I'm trying to think if there's another easy way to get to a menu that will, in fact, let you. Uh, I don't see anything here. I do not see what I'm looking for. Yeah, that's pretty much going to be it, I think, as far as how our center cluster is set up. Now, it, it's. I could swear initially I had it. I wonder if there's something to do with our drive modes. Let's have a look, shall we? Let's go to normal. That's what we were on, I think. What happens if you go to off-road? Well, you get that little car sitting there. There we go. So there is a change when you go to off-road. Uh, they, they've even changed the fonts on the tachometer. That's kind of different. Uh, and if we go to sport, which is red, it's always red. You can always tell sport because, they're, yeah, look at that. Look at all the redness. Oh, me, that's a lot of red right there. And the normal is where we were, and it's, uh, it's normal. It looks a lot more like a regular analog setup. But as you can see, you have a digital speedometer and an analog uh, 
tachometer, and then your regular instrument array over here, your fuel tank and your uh, temperature gauge. Those, it's kind of weird how those are both kind of bunched next to each other. Uh, it's not like you're going to make a mistake reading it quickly as you're driving along, but it's different. It's a way of doing stuff. And uh, one of the things I love about this car, and it took me a second to find it because it's very small, but it's beautiful, is a trip meter adjustment right there. So we can go from A to B on your trip meters, and then there's our regular odometer. This is a 2024, and it already has 8,744 8, miles on it. That's quite a bit for, <laughs> for this uh, brand spanking new vehicle. But uh, it also has broken it in, I would say, and the tires are broken in. So, so everything's all broke in. In, 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 not a bad thing, not, not bad broken, but good broken. So um, on our left side here, we have our normal, everything's normal where you're, you're used to seeing it. It's also extended out a little further, so it comes right to your fingertips. Brilliant, brilliant design. It's simple, but elegant. I'll talk about this later when I'm driving the car uh, because I love that. It's a very tiny thing, but it really does make a difference on how the car actually feels when you're driving it. Uh, it's a nice move. Our uh, headlight situation right here, and you do have the button right here to press and, and turn on and off your automatic headlight dimming system. So that is very easy to find and convenient. Your right side is where all your windshield uh, wiper controls are, exactly where they belong. Uh, down here, we have your uh, cruise control, and this is to increase the distance and decrease the distance. A lot of uh, Vehicles just have a, uh, one switch for, for both, and this is how that works too, but it toggles. And it toggles in a way that is so direct and easy to manage that uh, it's impressive. Same thing over here with your audio adjustment, your volume and your, whoa. Uh. Hi, Jimmy. He's singing to me, hang on a second. Don't take it personally, okay. And then we have our, accessing our phone if you want to talk to somebody on the phone like uh what people always did when when cell phones first appeared on cars and people were driving around with their cell phones they'd always do the same thing they'd call say yeah well i'll be home in about five minutes and so waiting instead of waiting to call from home they would call in the car because they could so <laughs> that always cracked me up that's a long time ago folks that's back in the 80s 90s whenever they first started coming out um so our, our central screen is very, very widescreen, and this flashing that you see up in here is, uh, I have no idea what that is. It's probably watching everything I'm doing. It, there's so much going on right now. There was a very controversial article a few days ago about what Tesla and uh, Nissan are both doing as far as information they're sending back of what the driver is doing in the car. Uh, which, and there's, and neither manufacturer tells you in advance anywhere that is easily accessed that you're going to see that they're watching everything you do in the car. But is Mazda doing that? I hope not. I have no idea what else that could possibly be for. I mean, there is a degree of dimensionality here, and it's not quite 3D looking, but it has definitely got some depth to it. It's a beautiful display, very, very high quality display. And uh, let's go over here to our. There's our navigation. Uh, but it's a very, again, it's one of these things where they've done such a good job, in my opinion, of putting in a size screen that's really appropriate for the interior size. And not only that, it's beautifully low here. So you're never, ever going to have, some of these screens come up higher like this. And actually, yeah, they do slightly impinge on your frontal view. Uh, but this has no problem with that whatsoever because it's mounted just right. It's mounted almost exactly slightly below uh, your regular field of view. So, it, and it's a beautiful, elegant screen. And here's how we navigate right here. This is what I was talking about before. This is your command controller right here. And this is your tunage and your home screen. Boop. And now we're at home like that. And then uh, this is your return to the previous. And this is, well, what the heck is this? That's your navigation. So you also have a, a single knob here for your uh, audio. And the thing about this is, and that, that I'm not particularly thrilled with, is you do have to do an awful lot of work navigation-wise to install your favorites for your uh, music that you select. But this is 
facilitated to make easier by a favorites button right like there. And as you can see, there's my favorites, which only took me about 10 minutes to install and arrange and do all the things you have to do nowadays to uh, put your favorites in a car that you have not driven before. Again, with so many of th this stuff, you install it once you get the car as far as put your order, put all your favorites in there, and it's going to stay that way forever. You'll forget how to do it until you want to put another favorite in there, and then you go, well, how did I do that? What you, you hit this, and then you dot, what? You, you go to the, um, so anyway, that's just the, the, the age we live in, and we'll just have to deal with it. Uh, but anyway, this is actually, and from an ergonomic standpoint, this is actually a very nice knob right here because it's, it's easy, it falls readily to hand. And uh, we'll move forward a little bit, and here's our shifter. Our shifter is weird. It has a very strange thing. Park is off to the left here, so to put it in drive, you push in the little detent and go over here and go all the way down to put it in the drive. A manual mode, yes, we do have these tiny little uh, paddle shifters, and they are activated when you when you hit it. It'll do it'll do what you want pretty much. Is there a specific setting for? Not that I can see. Uh, it's that's basically how you go get in and out of manual. Is just use the paddle shifters, but it's it's kind of a it's kind of a bulky, in my opinion, a very bulky design. I don't. It's not horrible or anything, but. It's weird. It's different. It's everything on this car is different. We'll set that rear brake. There we go. Uh, then here is where I was selecting my my drives right there, right there. That's a, that's convenient right there. And then up here we have this beautiful. I mean, and it is beautiful. Your climate control area, and naturally these Napa seats are vent, are uh, perforated so that you get both ventilation and heating. You get a heated steering wheel. It's actually very easy to set your two zones here. Uh, you can turn on and off the rear because this is a massive three-row SUV after all. So it, it's, it's the biggest one they make. And I still, I've, 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 I've got to keep reminding myself to go back and look at the CX-9 as opposed to this CX-90 and see if there's a, a substantial differences above and beyond the fact that it has a different drivetrain in it. And uh, I, I, I think exterior, in, interior-wise, is it basically the same room and stuff? I have to look into it, but all I'm going to talk about primarily is the CX-90 that we're sitting in because this thing has boco, bo bocus, bucus. It has a lot of room in it, and this is uh, further enhanced. You got plenty, of, plenty of headroom in the front, plenty of legroom for your front seat passengers, your first row, your primary road, your command road, captain, co-pilot. Uh, go back here, and we have this beautiful, beautiful uh, panoramic room uh, roof that does open. This section does open up. I'm not going to open it right now because, as you can tell, it's raining. And uh, but it really enhances the feeling of spaciousness in this vehicle. And up yonder, you got your uh, sunglass store. You got your very, very good uh, dome. Uh, excuse me, map lights, one for each side. And everything's very straightforward. Again, uh, Mazda, this has always been a strong uh, point with them. As they get their stuff right, as far as making it ergonomic so that you're comfortable right away, and uh, I, I give them top marks for that. Here's our, our console, and in this console we have a fairly, oh sorry, I, was, I, was, I left you over there, I'm sorry. Uh, we have a fairly shallow area here, but there's enough to put a lot of stuff in there and a couple of your USB-C ports. Then you have a power port that's right up yonder, right there. Because, you know, you want to put cigarettes in there. Right here, do we have, yes, that is our QI, which I haven't tested yet. Let's, let's see my, uh, let's test it. Uh, I have my, I don't have my phone with me. Uh, I do that more and more. I must be getting older. But anyway, so that's your interior in your front section, and it's beautifully finished. And uh, this is not a uh, cheap car. This is a $67,000 car. But the feeling of quality is everywhere. I mean, it, they've just done such a good job, and the, and the workmanship is excellent. And, oh, yeah, and you got a nice Bose stereo, which you can't beat that, man. 
it sounds like a concert hall in here because it's as big as a concert hall. Ah, rain. Now look at the size of this rear door. It's massive, massive. Opens up 90 degrees. Excellent. Oh, captain's chairs. I'll put you here. Captain's chairs. And naturally, uh, they recline a little bit, like so, in our second row. Again, lots and lots and lots of headroom. Uh, look at there, got your shades. Woo! And then we got, whoa, that exploded. But the window only goes down about 89%. Hmm, hmm. But that's fine, I guess. And then we have this fixed console that is extremely similar to the one in the front row. Look at there, look at there. They're very similar, very similar. You press this, press this, and it's much, much deeper. So the people in the second row can just literally chastise the uh, driver and the co-pilot up there because we have such a deep and more useful console back here that also doubles as an armrest. So it works well, it's good. Leg room, excellent, it's good. It's not fantastically good, like a limo quality, it's not that at all, but it's good. And you do have a moderate sized drive shaft tunnel right here, which I do believe has a drive shaft going through it because this is an all wheel drive vehicle that gets its uh, rear drivetrain power directly from the transmission with a drive shaft. And But look here. Look at all the wonderful adjustments you have for your climate system, including <gasps> heated and ventilated for these two captain's chairs. Isn't that nice? I mean, that's, uh, you get all the amenities that the front seat guys get, and that doesn't happen all the time. Rarely, to be honest with you. USB-C's right there. Ventilators for your ventilated thing that you have so much control over. And once again, I, it's making me a liar, all these cars, because I have been complaining about the fact that usually there's only a pocket on the passenger side to put your uh, tablet or your magazine or your uh, manifesto, whatever you want to put there. But the driver's side rear seat passenger usually doesn't get that. Well, look at this. Look at that. You get one on this car. So... Again, they've thought of everything, and the panorama stops. I, I wish it went a little bit further back, but it's all right. You still get that sense of airiness, and uh, it's very, very, overall, it's very comfortable. It's nice to be able to adjust these seats. You can actually slide them back and forth a bit, and then you get that ability to recline a little bit. Now, which begs the question, Boots? How do I get to the third row? Well, let's see. We're gonna have to go out in the rain again here. Oh man, is it ever gonna stop? Probably not. Uh, we do this, we do that, and uh, hang on just a minute here. Let's do this. Let's put you there. Are you gonna stay there? Stay, stay. Oh, okay, that's good, actually. And I did this before, did I not do this properly? There, well, I didn't do this properly, did I? I'm, I'm having a good time with this. Well, anyway, you can, uh, that's basically how you access, if you're into accessing, which we all are if we're going to the third row. And here we go. Oh, here we go. Oh, this is what, this is all I had to do right here, is lift that. But anyway, let's put you back in position. Uh, see, this is what happens when you don't rehearse or read. All right. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to put you over here. You stay right there. Ah, what have I done? Are you okay? Hang on here. Ugh. Well, I'll figure that out later. All right. Third row. Now, it's, it's kind of cave-like. Oh, what the hell happened with this? There we go. It's kind of cave-like, uh, not totally cave-like, but sort of cave-like. And you have a very, very huge, let's see, it's A, B, C, D pillar right there. But fortunately, this vehicle has excellent backup cameras, which I didn't even show you. I should have showed you that. Oh, well. It's got really, really good camera system on it. And uh, this is surprising uh, in that it's very uh, habitable for... Uh, 
average adult person. And more than anything else, it has the proper rig to the rear seat so that you're not bent. The floor is always high on the third row on just about any vehicle you get in compared to the other two rows. That's just the way it is. But this one is much better because it's actually a lot lower than some of these things. So you don't have your knees up in your chin and two adults will be fine back here. It's, it's quite good. And look, there you go, your very own USB-C should you uh, choose to pour it in and use your device. You can do that. So all in all, we're looking at a real nice setup. And by the way, you can access this rear seat like that. That's one of the best ways to do it. I didn't do it properly. I, I screwed up. But it also seems to have a memory about where you set the uh, seat in terms of the uh, uh, latitudinal front fort, forwards and backwards. I probably broke the car is what I've probably done. Uh, let's see here. Oh, well. Oh, isn't this fun? I, I love the, the, the intense discovery process that goes on with reviewing the car. It's, every time you turn around, there's something absolutely fascinating. So this is, uh, this, what, what this is actually for here is, if you want to stretch out here, you can just relax. Ah, I've been hiking all day, I'm tired. And even though you're by yourself, although you could get your wife, your, your significant other, your au pair, and your children, and their dog, you can get pretty much all of them in here. And uh, just one big happy family. That's what it's designed to do, to de transport and coddle one big happy family. Wait, stop the presses. Uh, I mean, I hate to interrupt my own video, but I have to point out something because this came to my attention later. But I, I was just showing this particular display and I couldn't find any place to change it. And I was going crazy because I thought I saw a completely different gauge cluster display when I first drove this car. So it was driving me crazy and I couldn't find anywhere to change it. Well, guess what? This right here is what you get when your cruise control is activated. But when it's not, ah, <laughs> that's what I remember. And that's my favorite. I think that is an outstanding, uh, it's, it's like a, just a purely virtual version of what Mazda has already had, which is an excellent analog in, instrument and gauge cluster. Uh, so that's what it looks like when you're normally driving. Go to cruise control, and that's what it does. All right? Anyway, back to your regularly scheduled programming. I noticed about this 2024 Mazda CX-90 made me very, very happy because I've had this feud, a feud, mind you, with Mazda about something, and that is heads-up displays. Now, I'm not a fan of heads-up displays. If you've watched any of my other videos, you no doubt could discern this because I have stated I'm not a fan of heads-up displays and I'm still not and likely never will be on cars now airplanes if I ever find myself fighting a uh, flying an actual fighter jet unlikely at my age <laughs> if you did I uh, probably might like it if I was actually in, engaged in air-to-air -air combat which is also extremely unlikely but each to his own. If you like it, fine. God bless you. Enjoy. But in my case, I don't like them. So naturally, if I get into a vehicle that has a heads-up display, the first thing I do is turn it off. But with Mazda's, what I've had to do up to this point was turn it off every time I started the vehicle because the default position was on. And so I, I used to pester Mazda over seriously over like the last several years about I still have to do this. I don't like doing this. And nothing. You know, they say, well, it's just the way it is. Well, on this car, you see 
there is no heads up display on right now and I just started the car <laughs> and the reason is and by the way it's called the command control uh, what what the heck is it what the heck is it called let's uh, let me find out in vehicle displays it's called the active driving display uh, and I don't like it so I, I turn it off and it stays off now so thank you Mazda because that was driving me hillbilly crazy there's a lot of other stuff on this car I'm gonna have to learn about. Even though I've uh, I've gone over the interior, but it's still doing things. And, and the main one is I, so I'm not the only person steering this car. There is definitely something else going on. And so I think there's some kind of uh, accident avoidance, lane keeping, something or other that I have not managed to turn off because I mean, I tried earlier to find it in the oh I didn't even see this. God I was looking for that for everywhere. There we go. I'll reset the trip meter. Wow, we're getting along better already. Now then, as, um, as mentioned earlier, this thing has this amazing new engine in it. Uh, an inline six-cylinder engine that is turbocharged. And there are all kinds of different ways you can turbocharge an inline engine. Uh, you've heard of uh, twin turbo or twin power turbo in the case of BMW. One of the most interesting aspects of, of how some people turbocharge an inline six is you got three cylinders and you get another three cylinders all next to each other. And there is a pulsing thing that, that is created in the exhaust system through the normal process of the engine running. Uh, when the combustion process where one cylinder is, is taking place and it's on the compression stroke here, the next one is maybe on the intake stroke all that stuff you're familiar with all that right right of course you are well there can be a pulsing effect that at different rpms the turbocharger if you just have a regular turbocharger mounted onto this engine sometimes it's going to get a lot less air than it is other times in other words the exhaust flow is going to be diminished for a second and then come back it's it's a, it can set up a weird pulse so in order to counteract that, they've come up with some really clever stuff. And in the process, they've also figured out ways to fine tune the response of the turbocharger such that you'll get a real nice spread of power from low RPMs to high RPMs. It's, it's, it's raining, uh, by the way. <coughs> so on this vehicle, I've, I haven't been studying on it yet. <coughs> it's telling me to turn left. Why is it doing that? See, this is why I don't like these self-driving, uh, what I would call their, their safety-oriented self-driving things, because they do stuff like that. They just interfere with your driving. There's a big difference between interfering with and assisting you from not crashing into a telephone pole. There's a, it's not a fine line. There's a huge gap in between there. Well, wow, I'm starting to wonder if you can even hear me anymore because of the rain. I'm having to slow down. We got, we got a definite flash flood situation. Can you see that? Look at all that rain. There are two words you must remember in weather like this. Slow down. And you got to learn, as so many people have to learn every, every, day, every year, all over the world in places where you get floods like this, that there's time that the vehicle's not the place to be. So don't start pretending it's a submarine like that James Bond movie, that Lotus that turned into a submarine. Unless you have one of them, you gotta remember that uh, this thing can drown just like any other large, heavy object. I remember we got a lot of traction years ago out of the Volkswagen Beetle, the original Beetle, because it was practically airtight. They even showed it in a commercial of one of the, the, the spokesperson for Volkswagen driving the Beetle into water. And it was floating and he's going, it's practically airtight. Wasn't quite that good, so. Now where are you going to tell me to go, huh? Huh, Carl, what, what's your idea here? I think I'm going to head straight because that seems to be where the, uh, where the lighter sky is.
So my all-wheel drive system is uh, is probably uh, just hankering to do some all-wheel drive. And here's some here's this area gets flooded a lot right down here. There we go. That's not bad yet, but it will be. Wow! Look what I did for you. There's no rain for a change, so we can actually see how quiet this uh, the CX90 is, and it's actually pretty quiet. I'm also going to activate. Well, it's so wild it does that. It spins and does things. When you put this thing in uh, your adaptive cruise control mode, well, you know about it, because it does all kinds of things to tell you what it's doing. But it's, it's very quiet, this vehicle, and, and one of the areas I think it's most quiet is road noise. There's not a hell of a lot of road noise. There's some, but that it, it's a perfect combination between fairly low wind noise as far as the aerodynamics of the upper cabin are really good uh, i'm not sure if mazda has some kind of special low noise glass like a lot of manufacturers do these days but i would assume they probably do uh, the ride quality and everything else on this is nice it tracks nicely I, I, I keep thinking with a vehicle like this, I feel like I'm in a minivan just because of the space. And, and when I, whenever I feel like I'm in a minivan, one of the first things I think about is long trips because that's what they're so good, good at, you know, and especially long trips full of cat, uh, people and cats and dogs and children and luggage and all that kind of stuff packed in. Uh, and the one thing about, a lot of people don't realize this about some of these vehicles is they have enough, so much room in it, but they also have to realize when they're doing the designing and the engineering of the vehicle that with all this space, it will be occupied by things that weigh stuff. Like if you have a seven passenger minivan, for example, it's entirely possible that you'll have seven adults in it at some point and maybe a little cargo on top of that. So the uh, load capacity of the vehicle has to be fairly high. Same thing with something like the CX-90 where you have all this room. Uh, you do just have captain's chairs in this particular uh, model, which is your premium plus. You do have captain's chairs instead of a bench, so you can only get two people back there. But they can be two large people. So you got that, let's say we got 200, uh, we got a couple of 200 pounders back. That's 400 pounds right there in those two seats. Then you got another, let's say 400 pounds sitting up front. That's 800 pounds right here. Then you have the third row. So the load capacity of vehicle has to be high, high enough. And it is, they're built for this. Uh, so that the, the chassis, the suspension and everything doesn't get completely out of hand should you find yourself hauling all these people and things. And that's where I'm always very impressed with ride quality because on the other side of the coin, most of the time the vehicle could potentially be uh, driven by somebody who's just commuting for the most part to work and it's just them. So there's not a load on the car and yet you still want it to ride smoothly and handle well like this very definitely does. So that's, it. that's impressive engineering. To make all these things, all these particular situations work. Let's put the map on. There we go. I have a, I have the screen set. I believe I set this one on uh, nighttime all the time, just because I I find the white screens to be harder to read than the, the dark screen. That's just me, especially on a bright day. Uh, but the, the graphics are so good on this screen. And I really like this ultra wide, low profile format to the touch screen. It's in direct contrast to the touch screens that so many people are going to nowadays, like Subaru, Volvo, where you have a big portrait size that covers all this area. When you cover all this area, that is pushing you over to more and more full touch screen operation. And I find touch screens to be not very satisfactory, to be honest with you, as a way to navigate. Because you have to take, unlike a switch that you can find, locate, 
learn its position and everything else. You don't have to take your, uh, like if you have good old radio knobs, you want to just turn the volume up. And a lot of this has been transposed over onto the steering, which is fine, provided that it is real distinctive from the 99 other things they're putting on the steering. But you, you, when you have a situation where you have that touch screen, it really does distract as much as anything else. And then, so which begs the question, why do it? And they're doing it because everybody is getting so used to doing everything on touch screens with their tablets and their phones. And they, that's, that's why they do it. That's their explanation of why they do it. And what, what are you going to say? I mean, it's, they have a valid point about that's what people seem to want. But it has not been good for things like collisions. Because <laughs> uh, car accidents are up, car fatalities have been up for a while. And I think there's a direct correlation between when that started happening and the advent of more and more, so, well, just cell phones in general. But now that they're, you're basically turning your car into a big cell phone, where, what are you gonna do? Now, our drivetrain, this all new, completely unique to the class, inline six that's turbocharged, has a real interesting feel to it. It doesn't feel like, I was expecting it would kind of feel like uh, the old V6s that Mazda has had, and everybody's had actually, really doesn't. It has a, 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 I don't know how to categorize how it's different, but it just feels different, it sounds different. You can tell you're, you're dealing with something different. That's all I can say about that. Pickup and everything else seems very good. Uh, the balance of this turbocharger seems very good. It seems fairly linear and I, I haven't detected any really huge hits. Uh, but it, it, there, there's all kinds of things at play here too because they're really, number one with, with turbocharging, a lot of people don't realize this, but it's absolutely true. The main reason that manufacturers have gone to it is not for, for gas mileage, it's for, um, to meet emissions because the compression of the air in the cylinder makes for more efficient combustion, more efficient and complete combustion. So that's why you're able to get so much more power out of the same size engine that you used to get like, say 140 horsepower out of it, now you can get 210 out of it or something like that. So you have that situation where uh, you're getting better emissions. And then it does definitely help, depending on how you drive and what kind of driving you're doing and the load that's on the vehicle, uh, turbocharging can be very uh, conducive to better gas mileage, no question. But those are the two main reasons everybody's doing it. Uh, the problem you have to rectify, in my opinion, is, is does the ends justify the means? And the ends being a very complex engine, which is much more involved, has more parts and everything else and more potential things to break than the older engines do. And that's that's a problem. For as we all know, I mean for three or four years you're probably going to be under warranty and everything's going to be just fine. You're not going to be out a lot of money if something does go wrong. But after that, and, and so many people still to this day do sell their cars quickly. I mean they, they they keep them a couple of years and then, or if they lease, a lot of people lease cars. You look at all these different things and you determine what's best for you as far as your financial situation, but you also you have to look down the road into how long you plan on keeping the vehicle. And then there's all this hassle with changing out. I mean, if you're just going back to the Mazda dealership, for example, and just trading it in on a new version of the same thing. That's a lot easier to do, a lot less time consuming and paperwork consuming. But if you decide to switch to something different and a different manufacturer, uh, you have to, that's a lot of stuff you got to deal with every two years. And I prefer, my methodology is the following. I recommend that you really shop carefully before you buy a vehicle. Pick out the one that is going to be perfect for you for at least the next 10 years. I know manufacturers don't like this, but 
I like a car to last at least 10 years because that's when, uh, in my opinion, there's two, there's a culmination of two different good things. One of which is you're driving a vehicle that you have a lot of experience with, so you pretty much learn how it's going to react in any type of circumstance. Great gobs of Mazda. Well, here's our rear suspension. And boy, look at this. We got multi-links. We got links everywhere. We got links up and down and to the front and to the side. And all these things that make a multi-link rear suspension multi-link. Here's our top link. Here's our lower link. And there's some plastic and more plastic. And this looks like it's actually made out of this over here. It looks like it's actually made out of metal, which it is. It's actually fairly metallic in nature. And if you look <coughs> up in there, you can see your uh, drive shaft and your actual, we have a coil over shock situation right here. Here's your shock absorber going right in between this coil spring right there. And here's a front link that appears to be of the aluminum variety, kind of a lateral link up there. That's actually not a front link, it's a lateral link. And the actual front link Let's see if we can see it better over here. Uh, we can't, actually. Um, <clears throat> it's up in there. Uh, it's it, that, that's it right, right, right about there. Uh, there we go. But anyway, there's links of plenty, folks, to locate the rear tire. <clears throat> and it, as is uh, typical practice, we have... <clears throat> let me clear my throat again. <clears throat> yeah. Gosh, that's terrible. Um... We have our sub-cradle, sub-frame structure back here that is your basic suspension that is bolted to your uh, unibody construction. And one thing that's impressive, you notice right off the bat here, is all this protection in here. This is, looks like it's mostly metal. And it keeps the underside of the body, of course, very aerodynamic, but at the same time, it does offer a little bit of off-road protection. And this is not the king of ground clearance, but it's pretty good for a vehicle, especially with this vastly long 123-inch wheelbase. You're going to need that uh, if you ever have to do any turning around and that sort of thing. Uh, it's all it's covered everywhere, too. I mean, you got this right here on this side and this right here on this side and all up through the front. So everything is pretty well uh, covered up. And that's nice because that can help keep uh, the trail crap from bang banging up into anything that might be uh, valuable to you. It's not real good at um, shedding off heat, though, but I don't think that's going to be a problem in any way, shape, or form. Speaking of which, if you look at our differential right here, oh, there we go, er, eat. there. Look at here, we got our beautiful little, uh, what we, I like to call them fenestrations. But they're, they're castings that have, uh, are designed to shed heat, basically, more than anything else. And it is, looks like the primary uh, component that goes into our rear differential is aluminum. So uh, to keep that cool, uh, there is a drive shaft, of course, that goes right up in there. There she goes. Is that it? What's that? I can't tell what that is. You tell what that is, do I don't know what that is. Well, anyway. This is not a uh, one of our electric partial electric hybrid setups where you would have a rear differential that is powered by its own power source, i.e. an electric motor. This is purely mechanical in nature, but it is very, very well protected, and it's all tucked in, up in there so that you don't have any problems uh, banging that on the trail should you decide to head down the road less traveled. But anyway... Pretty complex situation back here. If you ever had any componentry that you had to repair, I'm gonna move my light here, uh, you would uh, have a lot to repair because there's an awful lot of pieces to it. But it does do a great job of both uh, locating and damping your ride. So when you think about it, with all the room in this thing, you could put an awful lot of uh, weight in terms of people. And we'll look at that in just a second what the actual weight capacity is. But this, uh, this is a vehicle that due to its size more than anything else and its configuration to carry a lot of passengers has to deal with a lot of weight. So the suspension is pretty stout. It has to be in order to do that. 
and uh, it's not going to encourage you to go rock crawling or anything like that but at the same time it's very very uh, solid for the most part it doesn't have the uh, the glorious all aluminum structure that so many rear suspensions have on ve some vehicles in this class but you're starting to spend some real money there although this uh, the CX-90 is not exactly cheap but you get what you pay for I think uh, it's very very well engineered and designed and I think quite a step up from what the uh, CX-9 was so we move on and we approve of our improvements well look at all this you have in fact experienced the 2024 Mazda CX-90 how about that a turbocharged inline six cylinder all kinds of bells and whistles and uh, room room and more room uh, what's your base price $59,000 $950 and with options we came to $61,920 and our overall MPG is 25 miles per gallon. I got a little less than that but I always do on these tests. So uh, what you thinking? Do you need room? Do you not really want a minivan? Do you want standard all-wheel drive in this new really interesting inline six cylinder? Well if you do here's your car. Thanks for watching ladies and gentlemen and drive carefully out there and we will see you before you know it next time. Whatever the tube tells you, you dress like the tube, you eat like the tube, you raise your children like the tube, you even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion.